Chairman. Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Budigig. Uh, in addition to sitting on this committee, I serve as chair of the subcommittee in the judiciary on the administrative state regulatory reform and antitrust. You said on CNN, I uh, believe that, quote, the Department of Transportation has generally not gotten involved in these merger cases, but that's changing today. Is, was that statement in reference to the JetBlue Spirit merger? Yes, partly. Uh, it troubles me somewhat as, as you know, being on the uh, subcommittee on antitrust in the judiciary, because um, the, the DOJ is already reviewing airline mergers to see if the mergers are anti-competitive. And um, it seems like a waste of resources for two agencies to duplicate work, but I'm worried that's exactly what's happening if, if DOT and DOJ are gonna review the same, uh, the same merger. So um, do you think that the DOJ and FTC, uh, for that matter, matter, are unable to review mergers and protect American consumers? Oh, of course not. The way the division of labor works is that we have distinct but sometimes overlapping authorities. And so as is often the case when you have different parts of the interagency dealing with the same issue, we seek to the extent that it's statutorily appropriate to coordinate. I'm gonna be limited in how I talk about this because of course this, this is an open proceeding. Uh, but what we're trying to do is stand with DOJ, align our authorities where they cover the same turf, but also recognize that with regard to our, in my view, uh, too long unused authorities around public interest, that we're also ready to activate those, especially because depending how the DOJ side uh, goes to disposition, it might uh, compel us to take other steps. Uh, again, I don't wanna get into the case too much, but depending on what's appropriate. Do you, do you agree that um, they're the only ones who should be evaluating whether this is anti-competitive or not? Do I agree that the DOJ- I mean, you said that you both have some authority here, but that you didn't wanna duplicate it, and they're, they're main authority and responsibility is to decide if this merger is anti-competitive. Uh -huh. uh, you, you're not seeking to relitigate that, are you, after their decision? Well, again, we, we're trying to uh, work with DOJ to the extent that's appropriate. And then we have our own responsibilities that are separate. So, um, you know, they have a standard uh, for anti-competitiveness. Uh, what is your standard of or principles, the limiting principles of whether this is in the public interest? Well, again, let me take care to, to, to caveat that I'm not commenting on the open proceeding, but I'm, I'm talking Right, I'm about talking generally. Uh, so it, it really follows from, from what the law calls for. And uh, again, there's, there's really two sides of this. So uh, there is DOT's responsibilities and authorities with regard to competition policy that are laid out specifically in the law, even though they haven't been used very much. And then there's also, uh, in addition to the Clayton side, there's the public interest responsibility that we have that is somewhat distinct and will have to follow a distinct rubric uh, from what is applied in the uh, jurisprudence you've had around competition on the DOJ side up till now. Can you give me some examples of things that uh, might run afoul of public interest that aren't in the domain of DOJ's responsibility to determine whether it's anti-competitive or consumer welfare benefit? I think if I tried to get into hypotheticals, it would uh, be at risk of being perceived as prejudicing this case. But what I'll say is that the law is written differently with regard to our competition authorities, creating an overlapping, not identical, uh, but also not simply parallel authority. The, the reason we have uh, questions here is it's been about three decades before it, since somebody said a statement like yours that uh, leads us to believe you might be relitigating or some of the things DOJ is doing. So I'm looking for the limiting principles. Yeah, so again, I, I don't want to make case law on the fly here, but <laughs> we have a responsibility to review the, the public interest associated with these competitive dynamics that was handed to entrusted to our department, basically as a condition of deregulation. At the time of deregulation, it was confidently pronounced that we would go into the future with dozens, if not more than 100, competitive major airlines. As you know, we're, we're depending how you count, uh, down to four or five. So we know that there is something in the way that this has been practiced over the decades that is, uh, at the very least, out of alignment with what was expected as an outcome of regulation. And that's why we think, following the law as written, uh, 
I got three seconds left. More involved. I appreciate that answer. I got a real quick question. Tesla spent billions of dollars on a, on a charging infrastructure, and now the government says they're going to do the same thing. Uh, what's it going to cost the government to do this? And doesn't it disincentivize private investment when the government comes along and says, we're going to create these chargers? Uh, what incentive does Tesla have to do it anymore? And um, when will there be enough charging stations available nationally that no family will again be prohibited access from one of these chargers due to a cabinet member's promotional tour? What's great about Tesla's uh, decision is that they're opening their chargers to not be a walled garden, but to be available to other vehicles too. We welcome that. Uh, but even that built infrastructure alone of, of Tesla's, which is remarkable, is not on its own enough to meet the, the national charging demands of the country. The simple answer to your question of how much is that we have $7.5 billion going against this goal as, as provided by IIJA. But the other thing I would point to is that uh, there will be gaps in areas that it might not be profitable yet for a company to install the charger. And I would point here to rural areas or low income areas as an example where we want to make sure we accelerate that process. And so that's why we think it's appropriate and important uh, to introduce those federal dollars to speed up that process alongside the private sector dollars. And it's going to be a race. I mean, getting to that 500,000 chargers that the president envisions by the end of this decade will require both with uh, those installed with and those installed without federal subsidies uh, to move at, at, at a, uh, a really fast clip. My, my time's expired. I don't think there should be a race between government and private enterprise. Uh, oh, it's not a race between us. I, we're, uh, we're racing in the same direction. And I yield back.